Kia ora and welcome to Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Now look, there's nothing that you haven't heard before that I'm going to say in this intro and that is probably part of the problem here. People are talking about what we're going to talk about in the hallways, at the water cooler, in the rugby clubs, on their couch. No matter where you are within New Zealand and in some cases around the world, there's pretty much two topics of discussion. How on earth did the All Blacks get this bad? And will the coach keep this job? So as you can tell, it's going to be a pretty light discussion today. James Parsons. <laughs> <laughs> and, and joining us down south. I might leave. <laughs> <laughs> Bryn Hall has gone. We've got Joey Wheeler. Bryn is on camp. Joey filling in. Mate, this is a good week to come in on the show. Yeah, thanks uh, for the short ball for this week. Obviously, uh, plenty going on. I'll, I've even been getting stopped. Uh, my daughter's play ball, uh, which is for three to four year olds I got stopped by I think about three or well, one was a mother and two other dads um, basically dressing me down about uh, Ian Foster and his credentials so yeah it certainly is the talk of the town and, and everyone's talking about it and what is you know I've been a disappointing sort of month and a bit for the, for this all black side and and it just seems to be continuing uh, on that on that way and it didn't start the South African tour the way they would have liked. We were expecting some backlash, but we just never saw anything, really. Nothing at all. I, I couldn't believe it as well. Like, it's the most active my phone's been on a Sunday for a long time. Like, people, there's genuine want for knowledge and, and trying to understand how, how we have ended up where we've ended up. Um, similar to Joey, it's, it's um, even today, like, around people are just, you know, what's, where's the answers, what's, what's happening? Um, so it's, it's definitely been an interesting 24 hours, even from a, a battling pundit's point of view. <laughs> what, and that's it. What do you say? Oh, look, I sort of go back to what we spoke about last week. We knew what was coming from the Springboks, and we, we spoke a hell of a lot about the aerial game, but the four facets to it is not letting them kick on their terms, so having that good set piece, and if it's at a breakdown, you, you have that sort of one bullet, two bullet, into that breakdown to hopefully bobble the ball or set them off guard so that they can't just put the kick where they want to put it and then create you know little pockets for our guys in the backfield to jump into legally um, but you know we just didn't see any of that we, we they kicked on their terms um, they got the kicks pretty well pinpoint and um, they were just fantastic in the air I heard um, Israel Dag say today that you know he was just screaming at TV asking um, you know the back three to put a knee in one of their chests because what he was saying, and, and look, I'm not a, uh, a winger or a fullback, but they weren't taller than them. They weren't better exponents in the air, but we just didn't take charge of, of that contest, I suppose. But I always think from a forwards point of view, and Joe, you'll agree with this, is you have a massive role to play in that part of the game, and we went through it a lot, but that ability to disrupt the breakdown, disrupt the set piece, and create pockets of clear air for your guys in the backfield, and, and we, just, we just didn't do that enough. Joey, these are the basics, aren't the they? So, sorry, just on that point, what Jibba was saying, that's the most disturbing thing for me, is that this Springbok side, is it was just all one-way traffic. Like, it was like, where, where are the All Blacks? Why aren't they firing a shot? Why aren't they showing some sort of, I guess, a little bit of fight? And I think that from a New Zealand um, public's perspective, that's, you don't mind losing, but when you, when you lose and you're in the fight, I think... You can you can deal with that, but at the moment, what, what we're seeing is that it's just all one way traffic. And when you're questioning an All Black side on sometimes their desire, um, that's that's a worrying worrying sign. And our educated um, rugby public are doing that at the moment, and I think they're right in doing that. And I think some of those um, areas that Jip was alluding to, especially around our kick chase, uh, we're just making it too easy for these guys. Like they're putting up contestable kicks, and it was like giving them a free run to our to our guys catching the ball. We had no one trying to check these guys, block these guys from even getting um, uh, to our to our guys that were trying to get up in the air. Then when they were, they are basically smacking them to the ground, counter-rucking, or the next ruck after that, they were getting a turnover. So it was just far too easy for these Springboks. And that part of the game, like you said, Jip, with our forwards, I, I don't know whether we're not coaching that facet where – they need to get in front of a couple of these guys and just try check them a little bit to stop their flow coming through but, into those wide rucks. But even man, it, it's a devastating effect. It was just too easy for them. Too they, easy to get out of their half. They did it to us though. They counted a lot of our ruck, which bobbled the ball for Aaron and, and Finlay, and it showed that it, it, about two rucks later there was a turnover because 
we weren't attacking on our terms due to that pressure at the breakdown. And I just was surprised that we didn't put heaps of pressure on that. We knew they were they did that centipede thing, so you knew they were going to box kick. So you could really just apply some heat on those those guys in that area. It might not have worked all the time, but even if it worked one out of ten times and you get a turnover and or you create a little bit more time for your mate at the back, because it is easy to have a crack at the back three, but that's why I'm trying to bring up it. Like there's so many um, roles that lead to a successful um, contest in the air um, that that just weren't there. It just was surprising to me. Considering we knew exactly what the Springboks were going to do, we saw this against the Lions, we've seen this against Wales, we've seen this from the Springboks for years. Joey, how on earth were they not prepared for this? We saw the preparation for the lineup ball, we saw that turnaround, yeah, that was awesome. but surely this was as important a preparation as that was. Yeah, I, I think from, from the breakdown perspective, that's Obviously, they addressed their, their line out more, their defensive line out more. They d they did a great job in, in defusing that. Obviously, there were some malls where where the Springboks chewed off a, a, a few meters, but they're one of the best mauling teams in the world. So that's not surprising. But I think we showed a lot more organisation in that in that respect, uh, which was which is promising compared to the Irish series. But the the real concerning part of our game is is our breakdown, and I think from our attacking point of view, um, especially around our forwards. I believe we're we're probably lacking a little bit of urgency, and I, and I think that comes down to maybe um, our attacking structure. We seem to be quite trying to use the width of the field rather than being maybe a little bit tighter. And what we saw in the Irish series, the Irish type forwards using tip balls, um, changing the point of attack, and then getting a really fast clean over the gain line to then create fast ball. What we're seeing in this All Black side is basically let's throw it to a one-off runner. Hopefully he can beat, get on the outside of his guy, and, and then we can bring our cleans in and, and get through, um, get the quick ball that way. But we're just getting two man tackles every time. Sometimes a one man tackle jackal straight over there, and, and our cleaner isn't there to to get past the ball, and we're getting turned over with ease. And that's the most concerning part for me is our attack hasn't doesn't seem like it's evolving um, to counteract these defensive lines that are just bringing so much heat that you actually sometimes need to put this their line speed under pressure. And how you do that is through little tips, little changes of the point of attack to then get behind them because that will then slow the next wave of defensive pressure. So at the moment, it's just down to our ball carry. And I think that comes down to we're trying to spread the field too far to spread their defenders. They're willing to leave two, sometimes three attackers on an edge and just bring real heat through the middle and real heat on our on our edges and then back themselves to cover if we do manage to uh, find a way to get it to the width. So I think we've got to address that part. I mean, Jace Ryan, he's been in there and he alluded to it in his, one of his first press conferences that the breakdown was a real issue with the forwards. So I'm hoping that he's been in there for a couple of weeks now and, and that we see a little bit more improvement going into Ellis Park. But man, it's got to improve a lot if we're going to see the All Blacks evolve, which is that free flowing, on top of the game line every time. And I, and, and I, I just think some of those front rowers, Chip, I don't know what you think. I just don't know if they're giving us enough in that, in that area of our game that um, we've, we've used to seeing before where that's where all black teams in the past have always dominated. I definitely think Samasoni did. He, I, I thought he had a good game, um, Samasoni Takiyahu, really accurate in the line out, strong carry, strong cleans. Um, I suppose there's one example um, with one of Marx's turnovers is Arm um, just checks Bauer. He's the tip runner, the guy outside the ball carry, and just checks him just a little bit, and it was deliberate, and it just didn't allow him to get into that breakdown quick enough. And we spoke a little bit last week, Joey, on the podcast, is that sometimes starting the game with almost let's bin the tips, let's bin the back balls, and let's just carry strong and almost know you're going to clean so that you can sort of tighten up and just yeah. get past the ball and then get a bit of mo momentum. And if they do bring the line speed, you can still do your cross-field kicks or your attacking little chip kicks to slow it. And if they don't slow, then you will get some rewards off that eventually. But if they adjust, then you can go through the hands. But we sort of went out the back of our pot off nine and then we yeah. played out the back again. And that's like three or four passes against a rush D and we dropped the ball back. That's a, that's a lot of passes to get through against a passive D let alone someone that's prepared to rush and leave the, leave the space that Joey's talking about. To me, it looks like the players don't believe in the system. They've seen it fail. 
They've been involved in it failing against France, against Ireland, against South Africa, against Argentina. I wonder whether their lack of commitment to whatever is trying to happen or their inability to make whatever they're trying to do happen has got to do with the fact that they know it doesn't work and they don't believe in it working. I can only go off personal experience as a player and I don't think it's ever they don't believe in it because they'd surely say something during the week. Like these guys are still great players like they, they, and they're great leaders. But it's more, it, it just looks like, and, and I've been there as a player when you're a losing team, it's like the harder you try, the worse it gets. And, and there looks like there's a hell of a lot of effort to get through plays and systems, but you know, we sort of, the one thing that always works when you're under pressure and it's not going, is just simplifying it. Cutting the menu down, being really clear, like, I know this sounds basic, but like in the first 10 minutes, right, let's hold the tips, let's, and let's just clean and carry hard, and everyone's on the same page. And then once we get some confidence and momentum going, then we can try and get to that edge or, or use our attacking, kicking game. But you've got to, like I hate to say it because it's such an old adage, but you've got to earn the right to do all those things. And the only way you can earn it is you know, having really strong set piece, really strong break, breakdown and being direct early. And you have to be direct. You have to take the spring locks on. You've got to, you know, because there was a period there where the tank was starting to empty uh, and the spring locks, you know, were, were sort of getting caught and they, they were tiring. But we just couldn't, you know, we just didn't have the ability to kill. And then, you know, they obviously rejuvenated themselves with their bench and, and, and brought it home. But, um, yeah, I, I, I still think the answers are there. I genuinely do. But I've been where they are in terms of um, that, that feeling of, you know, consecutive losses. And it does create a lot of anxiety and a lot of desperation. And sometimes that can lead to even, you know, poorer performances. OK, let's go there. Last week, you were very optimistic. You said New Zealand could win 2-0. Mate, I've had, I've had that many people... <laughs> remind you. Remind me. It's not funny. Are you still optimistic? I mean, you say that you believe there's stuff there, but really, looking at this game in Johannesburg and the future and what's happened, do you, is there proof for you there to be optimistic? I, I'm always optimistic because I do believe in our player base. Like, I genuinely do. Like, they don't become poor players overnight. Can it be turned around in a week after the performance? It, it's going to be a big ass. Like, I, I, I'll be honest. Like, I am optimistic, but the reality is Ellis Park, um, Springboks with a lot of confidence, it, it would be a big ask. I don't think it's impossible. I don't know how you feel, Joe, but I, I certainly don't think it's impossible because as I'm trying to explain to you here, that there are some basics of our game that if we get right, we can start playing rugby again on our terms. You know, you saw a glimpse of it where, uh, before... Akira threw the forward pass to, to Rico, but Bodhi's ability, our ability to counter-attack, and, you know, get a little bit of mojo going and, and, you know, can get Caleb Clark a little bit more in the game because we know how destructive he is, but it's that first 10 to 15 minute period, you know, you've got to be 100% on your set piece and you've got to be physical and dominant in those breakdown collisions and then you've got to put them under some defensive pressure. Make them start thinking, oh, this isn't going to work um, and, and, and get some small wins that way. And I, I still, and I'm, I may be crazy, but I still think we've got the ability to win this week. I th the Springboks are definitely favourites. But I'm, I'm just trying to say, like, the, the changes aren't that big, but it's, it just requires a real clear focus on what they're trying to achieve and how they're trying to stop this kick game. Because on the, on the weekend, I didn't see a lot of them trying to, Stop it. I did from Scott Barrett. He was trying to pull malls and, and hit them at, at times, but you know, they, they need to have a you know a clear plan together so that they aren't slow to breakdowns, they know what they're trying to achieve, everyone's on the same page and, and it, it almost happens instinctively. I'm not so sure. Um Alice Park, I'm a bit like you, Ross. I just think that is one of the most intimidating places to play. I've never obviously experienced it from a international point of view, but I know going there to play even the Lions, it's such an intimidating place. And <clears throat> you got to think after that performance, their first test, I thought that was their their one opportunity to, to beat um, South Africa on this tour was in the first test. And I just think South Africa are going to grow an arm and a leg from that performance. They, they bullied the All Blacks. And we don't often say that. And I think that's why I, I question... Um, one of your points there, Jip, around um, our player base, there's a, there's a couple of positions that I, in the past, where, you know, you look at an all-black side and you go, 
there are world-class players across the board. Um, and at the moment, especially in our pack, um, without Brody Retallick there, we're, we're just lacking in so much experience and that real tough edge uh, to go and beat um, a Springbok side that is cock a hoop on their um, spiritual home at Alice Park. <clears throat> I just think it's going to be a massive task. Uh, to your point around the, the things in our game that we need to get right, I, I agree around the, um, the attack in that, but I think our kicking game as well needs to improve. And we need to sort of maybe even look to, to do what South Africa did to us um, and putting their, their game under a little bit of pressure with our contestable kicks and to create a little bit more in structure because it was just so easy for them to, to exit their own half, whether it was through our, our poor discipline or our poor, our poor kicks, which then led to them um, kicking to space or putting our, our catches and, and their contestable game us under pressure and turning us over. So I think we need to, a lot more accuracy in that in that part of our game as well. And that comes back to, obviously, the main drivers, Aaron Smith and Bowden Barrett, doing a, a hell of a better job in that in that respect because I thought we were a little bit an, inaccurate in, in parts in that game, especially with our out-of-hand kicking. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think we could almost do more kicking, if I'm honest. I thought we played a little bit too much and we were sort of shoveling those passes in, in between the 240s. Like if you're not making any headway, you're almost just wasting energy, spending time in there. You might as well, and we all know of Wax Lyrical about the, the bomb off 10. I think Bodie's one of the best exponents of putting it up for his wingers to go and get. He does it well for the Blues. So, And I think that's what I'm trying to say about our player base is I've seen them perform this year. I've seen them do what we're talking about. So I, I just don't think it's that drastic a task because I feel like going through the review, you know what a, like a review's like. Joey, it, it's going to be pretty black and white where it needs to change. Like, it's not, there's no grey. It's very black and white. And you, you have to think and believe that these guys that perform for the Crusaders, perform for the Blues, they can do it. It's just going out there and executing. And, and maybe there are some key injuries and, and, and we're getting tested in our depth, especially in our front row. But... You know, yeah. I'm, uh, we're, I'm not too sure where the propping situation is at this week, um, but there, there'll be hopefully some guys coming back from injury, I'm not too sure, or they've got the young Cantab in there, he may get an opportunity. Um, but I just don't think it's that big a leap to say that these players can't turn it around in a week. It, it just... I, I don't know, we've been there. You've been there and you've lost at, and you've played poorly and the next week you've probably had a 9 out of 10. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, it's... It's there because it's such an easy review. It's not like they'd go to the review and go, geez, where did that go wrong? You know, it's going to be, they're almost going to know before well, walking out. Right, I hope you're right, Jeff. But the, the fact of the matter is that for the last three or four test matches, it's been the same thing as well. And we just haven't seen, and it hasn't been any change. So I think personnel, obviously, is, is one, one area that they might just try to rattle the cage a bit. Um, yeah, and, there will definitely be change. There, there has to be change. But what do you rattle? Like, uh, is it a change that you say in the tight forwards is obviously an issue? This is the danger, what do you right, rattle? The danger is for, for Ian Foster is that obviously his, his senior players have backed him and, and the danger is, is if he drops senior players, do they then, do they then back him going into um, what is probably the test match where his job is on the line? So... Uh, is he going to is he going to drop um, senior All Blacks? I, I don't think so. Um, I think he he might rotate a, a couple of guys out. But for me, I think the the front row. I, I'd I'd give young Ethan DeGru to crack in that loose head. I think seeing him ball in hand, he, he's quite direct and abrasive, and and he's got that little bit of attitude that you want to see against the Sappers. And and to your point looking to go through them early on, Jip, and and trying to get the ball in his hand and then give George Bauer that opportunity maybe when the game breaks up in that last 20 or 30 minutes, the opportunity to, to come on then. But, yeah, I think those... I don't know, does he is he going to go away from the experience of a Sam Whitelock and pick a, a Tupu Vai alongside Scott Barrett? I wouldn't have thought so in the cauldron of Alice Park. Um, he's going to back his experience, guys, to to, you know... One, show them the trust that he has in them going forward and hopefully they repay that in, in spades. But I think there needs to be some change and, and 
I'd like to see a little bit of spark from some of those young guys and give them an opportunity on the toughest stage in world rugby. But they say what madness is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. You've got to get the balance right though. You know, like you can't, um, you know, because it could bloody kill careers as well if you don't, if, if the young fella doesn't get it right. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, I've seen yeah. young guys get opportunities and they don't perform and they've never to be seen again, especially at like super rugby level. Um, not so much all black level because I don't think we've probably, well, in my time of the ability of analysing rugby, not when I was just a fan as a young fella, I don't remember a time where we've probably been this challenged mm. in terms of selection. And, and I still think facets of our game, like key facets of our game, like the line out, in particular, is so key against the Springboks. And that went well. And, and Sam White looks a massive. Like when he's there, the line-out does function well. He, he is the master of that. So, you know, like you, you don't want to start losing a source of possession. Do you know what I mean, Joey? Like it could, yeah, yeah. Like it, it's tough. Well, you just got to get the balance. Like the line-out was, was really poor in that last test. Obviously, they've corrected that. But then our scrum, we gave away five scrum penalties in that test match, which is ridiculously high. And that just took the foot off the throat in terms of our pressure game. So... Yeah, I don't, um, I don't even. To your point, I don't. Yeah. I don't like, even think it's. Even if you do, did you? Yeah. Oh, it's a. It's a hell of a position. Like, tough, tough position. But it's even just little things. Like, um, I think Sam Kane referred to it in his aftermatch speech. It was like, it's our scrum, and we overlean, and it gives them a free kick. You know, it was early on. I think just after Faf de Klerk got knocked out. Yeah. And you could see the frustration in him. He was just like, we, that's just a small moment we didn't need to lose. We just didn't, we just needed to be on there. And those sort of things snowball um, when you're feeling that sort of intense it's pressure. And I speak from experience. It's that discipline, but it's also the discipline inside the game. Like you think back to the Will Jordan line break, one of the few line breaks that we made throughout that game from a, a beautiful set piece. And then we go to, we force a pass where out to, out to the width, to um, Caleb Clark, who then gets bundled into touch. Mm. To me, that that's that's the discipline that this team's lacking at the moment of, of right, we've done a great job. We've made a, a, a 30, 40 metre line break. We've got them all under the pump. We don't need a score off that next phase straight away, unless it's a, a, like a guaranteed try scoring opportunity. We need to stay and keep building pressure and we'll break them three or four phases down the track. But that happened numerous times. Every time we seem to enter the South African 22, it was like, within three or four phases, we were turning the ball over or giving away a penalty through just sort of silly, silly errors, if that makes sense, mate. And, yeah. and I think those facts, again, that discipline, that ruthlessness that we're used to seeing in, in all black sides um, of the past is is missing in, in this side at the moment. And they are creating opportunities, but they're not ruthless enough or disciplined enough to finish them off at the moment. It's dumb. I, it's, it's a crude word, but the number of times I looked at it when people were being bundled into touch, those things were happening, I was just like, that's just, that's dumb. That's schoolboy level, not clever stuff to do. Look, I agree with you, but I'm, I'm just, from my point of view, having been in teams that have lost multiple games in a row, they're not setting out to, like, it's, it's through acts of trying too hard. I, I, it may appear dumb, but it's through, like, Caleb Clark was fending the guy off and running down the thing, but look in your arm, just came and buried him, you know, and, and that's that's because he's one of the greatest centers and defenders in the world. But yeah, I, I agree he should have stepped in and stayed in field, but it's not through lack of effort or lack of, um, you know, smarts. It's through desperation. Mm. Carrying on down the Foster <laughs> route, which, you know, is pretty much the only thing I think anyone ever talks about right now. He talked about after the game how he has belief. Sam Kane nodded. Yeah, we believe in what we're trying to achieve. The rest of the country doesn't see it and doesn't believe. Why on earth should New Zealanders believe in Ian Foster? I just don't think any rugby team is one man. And it's unfair to say, OK, yes, he's in charge. I get that. But it's more than one person. Like, it's, there's a lot of responsibility across the whole group. Mm. Joey, I don't know if you agree, but... Yeah, and I think I alluded to it earlier that, you know, a lot of these environments now, Ross, are, are, are very much like, that. yeah, obviously the, the head coach, the buck stops with him, right? But a lot of these teams are, 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 
you know, players have a massive influence on on these groups, and the All Blacks are no different. And I think sometimes we, yeah, you know, we're quick to jump down the coach's throat, and but that in the same breath is is probably sometimes fear because I, I feel like what you're saying, um, Ross, as well is, well, what, what are the answers? We're, we're, how are we going to get better? We don't, we're, we're, we're never given any of this. We just think we're seeing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. And, you know, you were saying about the de- definition of insanity. It's like, we just, ne- that, well, we just need to do that better. Well, that's not working though. Um, so what are you going to do to change that? And it feels like sometimes, and it looks like as well, I must admit that when Ian Foster goes into those press conferences, he, he he doesn't look like he wants to be there one little bit. He can't look reporters in the eye when they ask him a question. Um, and it sometimes feels like he's, he's struggling for answers as to as to where to for this All Blacks team. And, and that's where I think that pressure, that extra external pressure comes from is that the New Zealand, the New Zealand public, this is their team, and it feels like, we're not getting the answers to what is an underperforming all black side at the moment, but we're also not getting that from our, our senior player group who have a massive influence on this group. I think Sam Kane addressed it in his after interview interview. He, he talked about the lack of skill execution, the lack of ability to take the high ball, losing the small moments that were crucial in terms of turnovers. So he did give some answers of what was poor and what needs to change. But I agree when the, in those set press conference, they probably don't, write about the post-match interview, they write yeah. about what's in the, so it maybe needs to be addressed there or, or whatever. Because some people don't hang around for the post-match interview. Well, as a, as a journo, yeah. journo, you don't, because yeah. you've got to make your way through to the press conference. Yeah. So that's what I'm just you know, saying, like, that, I, yeah. I just wanted to say, like, like Sam's fronting up, I, I believe, um, and he did it straight away, and you could see he was furious. Mm. It's That guy's got a lot on his plate right now. Well, it's a... You know, it's a tough job being the captain of the All Blacks. Even if you're doing it, uh, even if they're winning every game, there's still an expectation that you win the next week. There's no, there's no time to button off. It, it, it's, it's a high pressure role. <laughs> <It's a, laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a brutal thing. Yeah, right? yeah. Like, even when when this team was at ninety percent, um, you drop a game, you just get crucified. Yeah. And now they're obviously, you know, under, you know, the they're but, trending downwards, and it's, it's even more brutal. The the pressure is just, it's relentless, and. Um, oh, but to your point, I, I, I agree, um, uh, Jip. He, he's, he's up front and he's honest. And I just think we need to see more of that. We need to see a little bit of or, or how are we gonna, how are we going to address that next week? What are we going to see that's, that's different? Obviously, we don't want to um, give plans away, but it's, it, it seems like the same thing over and over again is, is what's getting regurgitated and we're not seeing improvement. And I think that's what, what blatantly and – uh, is pissing people off. It's pissing the fans off. Um, they're just not seeing improvement, mate. Yeah, no, that's the right term. I think we, we talked about Jason Ryan when he came in and he openly addressed a few of these things. Sam Kane has addressed them. But when push comes to shove, the Springboks laid out their game plan on a plate for everyone. Malcolm Marks was the best sign of that. Like, we're going to attack how, you at the breakdown. How good we're bringing in Malcolm Marks. It was it to see him in a two jersey. <laughs> nice 16. Yeah, yeah. And He's so good. We knew what they were going to do. So, yeah, the All Blacks don't want to give away too many plans. You don't want to give away the intricacy of your pod and how you're going to run it or whatever. But to a degree, we need to be educated on what the hell is going well, on. Well, I'll use the Crusaders as an example, right? And, Joey, you'll agree with this. We all know how they're going to play. It's still bloody hard to stop. Do you well, know? And that's, that's the struggle, <laughs> right? Yeah. And they've done it for forever. You can, you can, honestly, every time you play the Crusaders, you know exactly what they're doing. But they've got the ability to run that game plan and make the right decisions on how they get, you know, like it, it, some teams have just got that confidence that they're like, this is who we are. Mm. <laughs> Take it or leave it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just feel like we are kind of in the dark across the board on, on this. They certainly have belief in what they're trying to achieve. We've got no idea what they're trying to achieve outside of what we're seeing fail. Um, mm. But there's one question that I have to ask you that it's going to put you in a pretty difficult position maybe, but I have to ask it because it's the one question that everyone asks each other in this entire country. Is Ian Foster gone after this Test match? Come what may. Well, I think it's been put out there publicly by NZR that there's a review of some sort after... The, so I, I felt like that was a message that 
there needed to it needs to at least be one one to to remain. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose. And the flip side, should he be gone after this test match on a more, with your perspective, should he be gone? It, I, I honestly find that really hard because. Yeah. It's just so close to the World Cup, like. But the, as we see the frustration from the fans, it must be making him tired too. Mm. Like he'd be going round the clock trying to sort things out, um, and and it may not be about him getting let go. He may choose to step down as well. Why would you want to continue in this situation? Everyone likes to be liked, Joey. You know. Yeah, I think that's the hardest thing. Like. He, might, he, might, he was probably blocking a lot of that that outside noise out, or trying to anyway. But it, it'll just be so hard for his family, I would imagine. But yeah, um, all this noise, it's just the the drums just are beating, and they are not stopping. Like, and the more that the All Black side doesn't deliver, the louder they're going to to um, bang, and they are already deafening. Uh, they must be deafening. And I think you're right, Ross. It might get to that point where he just goes, oh, I've had a guts full. Yeah. Um, he's obviously a proud man, and he, he, in his heart, believes that he's the guy to bring this All Blacks team out of this rut. And you've got to, you've got to tip your hats on on that because a, a lesser man probably would have walked away after that Irish series and gone, no, nah, I'm done. I'm pulling stumps. I'm out of here. Um, but... He's obviously got the backing of those senior players. He's got the confidence of the changing room. Uh, well, that's what he's um, said uh, openly, and, and um, that's what Sam Kane said as well. So you've got to trust him on that and hope that hope that he can get it right. But you'd imagine if he doesn't, if this team doesn't uh, win at Ellis Park, that yeah, it'll it'll be tough. I would imagine for him to um, stay in a job uh, and head into the to the World Cup, which is gee, what are we? Just over twelve months away from that, so well, yeah. The, I, the second and whether most, he wants to, yeah. I, I think it's probably more about him rather than others, but also the second most important trophy to the All Blacks team is the blue as well. So you know, like, like I, again, I referenced. I was listening to Israel Dag this morning, and he was like, "We we can't even we can't even bring ourselves to think that that you know if that if we lose the blue as well, that would be huge." So there's not a lot of time between now and then. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that the pressure's not going to stop for whoever's there. Do you know what I mean? Like, even like, it's sorry, yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, but that's the job. Like you know that signing up. But I, I agree with Joey. Like, and and having gone through it as a player, you do have the ability to go. This is my job. I'm zoning, and this is what I'm going to nail today to build me. But it's actually your family members that read it, you know, they 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 get consumed by it and it hurts, mm -hmm. and it actually plays a massive role on you know your your I suppose your close network of, of people and, and it's, it's brutal for them. Yeah, Whereas, right, Jim, it's, it's calming just, them down half the time. Yeah, is the the most stepping thing, eh? Yeah, and it's like because you 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 know it's coming. Like as a player, if you have a bad game, you're like, yeah, look, I'll put my own hand up, like shocker. I'm going to cop some flack. That's just, but it's just understanding. I suppose that's also part of why we're great. Mm. <laughs> it's getting the balance right. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying go out there and be abusive, abusive, but like that expectation, that weight of expectation, and that that pressure is what makes us so good. Because you know, pressure brings that performance of preparation, and preparation is what leads to success and consistency in performance. So. We don't want to lose that. We do need to temper it somewhat, I think. It's getting a bit um, outrageous at the moment. But it is, man, for families, it's, it's really hard for them because they don't sign up for it and they love you. Mm. So it's, it's, that, that'll become part of his wider you know, decision matrix, so to speak, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, certainly an element of perspective there. I remember talking with Mark Hammett when you know, he came into the Hurricanes and cleared house, you know, and... and Ultimately, it led to a title, um, the clearing of house and the refreshing of that um, player group. But man, he was almost run out of Wellington for you know getting rid of Ma'a and Pity and Andrew Hoare and Jose and all these guys who moved on. It was it was really tough for him, and and I think partly that's the reason why it didn't last very long. But that's what you got to like. Like Joey said, you got to admire 
that you know that's a courageous act to go in there and do it you're firm in your belief you understand what you need to do to achieve it and you go and do it not not on the basis of being liked or you know it's because you've made a plan and, and you've, you've stuck to it and you've got to admire that you know Ian Foster believes in himself mm. like he still does yeah uh, I suppose a courageous act is also walking away when you realize that it's just not working out and that was you and, know I think uh, yeah I mean it, uh, it'd be tough at the moment it'd be really tough mm. honestly most of that backroom staff has been there for a decade you know, we're talking about managers, physiotherapists, logistics people. This is a tight-knit unit that has been there through, a lot of them through Henry, through Hanson, and now, now. Like, that is, it's breaking up a fraternity. Um, you know, it's breaking up a team that has spent so long together. That, that's going to be an emotional time if they do that. Uh, yeah, it'll be tough. It's, and it's almost, there's so much to do that, if it is a consideration, I'm sure the planning's happening now, mm. like without being too cold, but like that's too much to do in a week. If the natural successor is uh, Scott Robinson, he, he'll want his team in there, right? He won't want to be tainted. Well, I think with... he deserves that though, do, doesn't he? Yeah. If you're going to yeah, take the job, because he'll right. be the one, like we're seeing yeah. with Ian Foster. It's it's him. Line, yeah. yeah, so he needs to surround himself with who he feels gets the best one bigger than one man and and that's what I think we're trying to say here um, Ross is that uh, there's a, probably a little bit more to it than just going well you get rid of Ian Foster does that solve, does that uh, solve the problem uh, I'm probably not sure not. it does uh, and if you do that then if Scott comes in Scott might say well I only come in if I want if I get my team I don't, I don't know but yeah you, you're probably right Chip he probably deserves that as well mm. well the jersey deserves it as well like we've got to give it the best opportunity to succeed, you know, like yeah, that's if, the reality. And if Razor, the buck stops with, thinks it's um, changing all that, then that's what you got to do. You got to you got to trust him as that guy. Oh, he's got a big week. He's got to change his personnel. We've touched on it, or he's got to change his team. Maybe, maybe he doesn't. If you were to change the side, where would you be looking to make changes, Chip? Well, if there's, I, I think if there's some injuries that come right, then, you know, I think they'll resort back to an offer and a nepo um, to start and, a, and an Angus off the bench, mm. like, cause that has worked well. Um, I do like the idea of De Groot. Let's not forget George Bauer has played a lot of rugby and a lot of international rugby yeah. and he's still, you know, very new into the international scene and, and the intensity, um, the, the weeks, like, I know he's come from very, you know, strict regime in the Crusaders, but it is, it can be draining. So a breather might just freshen him up for the well, second part he, of the year. I think he was one of our best uh, front rowers in that Irish series too. Oh, 100%. Uh, Chip, so. Yeah. But I, I just think a refresh, I agree with you. I just think he, he probably just needs to freshen up. And, I actually and like the grid off. Like, he, he, where he's done such a great job for the Crusaders for such a long time. I think he'd be brilliant. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, I, I think there were, Elements of surprise when Ethan missed out, especially after his performance, I think it was against the Blues, um, where he showed some real scrum dominance. So um, he's hungry. Hungry's good. Um, he's, he, he'll be wanting to make a statement, which is great. Um, and then I, I think Will Jordan's definitely our biggest attacking weapon um, and, and potentially giving him a, a crack at 15 where he's most comfortable is, is another option as well. More ball in his hand, more opportunity. Just the more opportunity with time, with ball in his hand. You know, like the moments he has with little inside balls and um, the opportunities he's had, he's, he's you know, been pretty electric. Um, so it's giving him more opportunity with ball in hand, you know, could be really beneficial to the stuff we're talking about is what makes us great at our game is that instinctive, off the cuff, unstructured, and he's what he's shown all year. He's probably the best at it. And Sebu Reese onto the right wing. I suppose. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't thought that deep to be honest. But yeah, I think he, he's he's Sebu's really good under the high ball as well. So he does have that um, component to his game. Um, but also, I think Geordie's shown he can play on the wing as well. Mm. And and height, his height is, um, you know, mm. impressive. And also, he's our kicker. So. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a, that's a really key point is the, the high ball, right? That was our biggest concern and issue on the weekend. And for me, 
I, I think our three best highball um, exponents are Geordie, uh, Will Jordan, and, and Bowden Barrett. We saw him, obviously, yeah, he got his legs taken out of him, but he is fearless in the air. Yeah, he, he gets commits. up as good as anyone. And, and for me, I think I would love to see that as a back three. I know Caleb Clark was got devastatingly good, but I just feel that we need to try to diffuse that that contestable kicking threat that the South Africans have and to give us the best chance of doing that. Yep, we can do a better job as forwards and, and as block, block runners, but we also need our best high ball exponents coming in under that ball fearlessly and getting up and contesting for that ball rather than, you know, only half ass getting up. So I'd actually like to see that back through and giving Richie Mwanga a crack at, at 10 um, just to just to try show something a little bit different. Obviously, that's injury dependent on Bowden and, and Geordie, and I don't know how bad Bowden's neck is or how bad Geordie's ankle is. So I, I'd like to see some change in, 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 that, in that area of our game. I thought Rico and um, Davey are developing a nice combination there, um, defensively pretty sound. I uh, would like to still see a little bit more um, an attack from them both. But, yeah, I, I think just some change in that um, that back three would be just to revitalise them a little bit, I reckon, Chip. Yeah. I, I do think Geordie has to be there somewhere because he's got aspects of his game others don't, and it's his height. And, and he kick a goal from 65, yeah, 70 metres yeah, he, probably. He's, he, and he's yeah. showing that he can do it on the wing. It's just somehow, you know, this may just be <clears> the change that creates opportunity for, for Will Jordan and also we can really use the best out of um, Geordie Barrett. But again, I, injuries dependent as well. You know, you've got to consider, I mean, that was a hell of a fall Bodie took. Whew. Yeah. And it did a, a, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, that was nasty. Um, if you're going to be spending the entire game playing in your own half, having Geordie Barrett kicking goals from 60 metres is relatively important. But also <laughs> scoreboard pressure as well. Like yeah. if, we can get some th- if we can get some scoreboard pressure early, you know, go up in threes for a bit. It does change the psyche of the opposition as well. Then again, we're doing things on our turn. Mm, mm, absolutely. Uh, Caleb Clark, maybe use him more outside 10 as a ball runner, taking it to the line. Like, if you're going to have David Harvili there, and we saw a 50 22 that wasn't a 50 22, we saw how important he could be in those territories. But that, for me, they've got to use Caleb Clark more as a bash and crash guy. I mean, he's got that in him, and they're lacking that direct running, and he can bring that. Absolutely, and, and it also takes multiple defenders to stop him, which means there's less green jerseys for the next phase. So I, I think the more he can be involved, the better, mm. personally. Um, yeah. Especially in and around those breakdowns. Um, inside yeah, 10, popping up inside point. Davey. Those yeah. sorts of channels, getting yeah. at different defenders. Yeah, getting a little bit busier in, in terms of the, the phase play. I'd like to see him doing a little bit more off Nuggy, uh, off Aaron Smith or whoever it's at nine. Or Like you said, inside that 10, I just love seeing him picking off those bigger defenders from um, the Springboks. I think trying to get them to move a little bit more, he could probably play a little bit more of a role in terms of our phase attack. Yeah, obviously what he does um, on, on the initial strike, he, he attracts multiple defenders but that also if they get it right they're going to meet him um, head on and he and he's probably going to go backwards rather than um, going forward so yeah I'd like to see him just offer a little bit more around the our face play attack get a little bit busier I think I think the greatest example of a left winger that works so hard off the ball is Colin Betty mm. man he's awesome he just goes from one side of the field to the other he creates mm. opportunities for himself um, so you know, he could he could certainly follow that trend. Like the, both the, the the way the Aussies play, their wingers are so busy. Um, it's 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 really impressive the work they get through because guys like Cotton Betty around that breakdown attract attention. So if they don't hit him, there's mm. potentially a hole for a tip runner, and and that's what we was trying I was trying to say with Ireland is all those bodies in motion. You, you're going to have to make a decision, and you're not always going to get it right, which creates the ability for for the All Blacks to get in behind. And we know once you go behind, it's it's easier. You know when you see a winger pop up in those situations, Jip, as a tight forward, that is the thing that we fear the most, yeah. right? Is seeing yeah. a guy that's quick on his feet, strong through the hips, you're going, oh, geez, where's he yeah. going to come? Is he going to come off, off nine? Is he going to come inside the runner? I've got to be right on here. Oh, I, you used to prefer seeing a 120, 130 kilo man coming at you because you know – 
generally he's probably just going to go straight at you. So it's a pretty easy tackle. Yeah. Um, he doesn't have the ability to beat you on the outside, the inside, run over top of you, where you've got to consider all three. So, but also, yeah, I think. It- it's it's not just you thinking that it's the guys inside and outside you thinking that and then, then you're not yeah. connected and that's how they penetrate it's, yeah. it's that old case you're looking at yeah. like, we're all good we're yeah, all good yeah. you're not really nah, and then they, then they go straight through you and score under the bar yeah and that's what made Martin Noni such a brilliant midfielder wasn't it because he could do everything like that he could put it onto his foot he could throw the big pass you just didn't know what was going to happen no. and we kind of seem to be lacking that element Within that area of the game, yeah, but we've definitely got a guy that can do it. Yeah, and Caleb, he can, he's got the skill set well, and he's got the power. Yeah. But you look at Will Jordan when the, he scores the majority of his tries for yeah, the as well. It's yeah, hovering. Situations where no, nothing looks like much is on, but he's seeing something that others aren't, and then he creates something out of nothing. So I think all and Geordie Barrett's exactly the same. You know, like these guys. They, they have that instinct. We're just not seeing that instinctive footy at the moment with this all-black side because I think it goes back to our initial carries because we're, we're just getting dominated in, in, in that sort of our pod runners, I suppose. And that, in turn, isn't giving those guys confidence to come in and, and try and jet themselves. But I think that's actually the best time for them to do it. Oh, one more question for you about the selection. Um and it comes down to the loose forward mix. Now, we've spoken a lot about the belief in Sam Kane. Um, Adi Sabe obviously is such a huge cog in the side, and then we've had Akira there. Watching them play against South Africa, it was quite obvious we needed more size and more direct ball carriers. I, I love what Adi does. I love his fight, but I feel like because he's smaller, he has to put so much fight in past the gain line that kind of that, that flow in the LQB doesn't happen as quickly as if you just had a big guy who was smashing it, going to ground, oh. getting the ball out, and I feel like they need one more of those guys to go well, into that loose forward mix. For, for me, it's bodies in motion. It's not, the reason why we're getting smacked is it's, it's predictable. So when there's other threats running committed lines that can be utilised, that's when the opportunities are created. If we think we're just going to throw a big guy out there and it's going to change it, it just isn't. It's, it's a complete um, 1 to 15 nailing your role time and time again. And I used the Crusaders before, but you know what they're going to do, but they are just so committed and so clear on their role, they just keep doing it, keep doing it. And it might not work the first five times, but the sixth, it works. And then bang, they score. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, so there will be times, we're not going to win every collision. But if, we, if we're really clear on what our roles are in an attack, it's going to create options for your teammates around you. And you. Or it could be you. But you've got to keep hitting the same hole, same line, time and time again. Make that defender make a decision and then it's up to the guy with the ball in his hands, ball in two hands, make the right call for a tip out the back, listening to comms, or just carry direct and, and you know have a, have a crack the next one. Like we Sort of like to Joey's point, it's like a chess chess game. You've got to go one step at a time. We don't need to score straight away off phase one or three or, or the first phase after a line break. It, you, you've got to go back to those roles and, and, and responsibilities, I suppose, and commitment to that to create the opportunity and have the ability to take the opportunity. Because mm. I, I do think we're creating some. We're just not taking them at the moment. What do you think about the loose forward mix, Joey? Uh yeah, I, I, I can sort of see your point, um, Ross, uh, but I also, he's our, he's our best ball carrier. Well, um, no, yeah, but I, I wouldn't I, take him out I, of the team. I just feel he needs to be no, complimented no, no, by no, more no, ball carriers. Yeah, I get that. And, and I think sometimes it feels like and it looks like it's just like, oh, let's give it to that guy and, and there'll be a little bit of individual brilliance. And, and Artie has the ability of doing that. But I feel like we're lacking a little bit from those other guys um, in the mix in terms of taking, shouldering some of that carrying burden. And I'd, I'd love to see a little bit more. It's always a criticism of Let's not Akira Ioane as, um, as his work rate and, and his ability to do it time and time again, keep making those really tough carries. And I know sometimes he's playing out on the edge, but I'd just love to see him come in and, and take some of those really tough carries. And Because and, he is, he's, we saw it against Ireland and we saw those, touches of individual individual brilliance but him complimenting um Adi is a great a great balancing act a great one-two punch we used to see it with 
Jerome Kleino and, and Kieran Reid. They used to do it so, so often. And those guys, yeah, they'd always generally create go forward for you. Um, these guys are probably more special in terms of their ball carries. But what those two, in terms of Kleino and Reid, did, they made significant amount of carries. And a lot of their carries were really tough carries into brick walls, but they always seem to make good meters and get their head through into a tough space, which Artie's doing, but I just don't see um, sometimes our other loose forwards shouldering a lot of that burden. Sam Kane tries, but again, he's he's getting isolated a lot of the time on his own and getting dominated in those um, in those sort of one-on-one situations or 2v1, creates a 2v1. So bodies in motion, yeah, that'll help, but also I think guys getting up and and wanting the ball, like give me the ball, I'll run it, I'll, I'll make that tough carry, I'll do that tough carry, and I'd just love to see a little bit more of that from Akira. Yeah, I, I think that's hard on Akira. I thought he did that in the third test against Ireland. That's why he got another start. Um, you know, there's other aspects of his game. You know, defensive lineouts. He's up every time. You know, he's doing. You know, putting pressure on there. Um, yeah, I, I I don't agree, and that's that's just how I see it. Like. A Akira works bloody hard, um, and he is prepared to take the tough carries. But I still think it's it's a it's a um, synergy thing with the whole group being committed to their role to, to create opportunity. Um, and then you will want to carry the ball because it, you know that that's your role within it. Well, that was some All Blacks chat. We've got no, no time <laughs> left. We've go. Shall we talk about the Wallabies for a second? Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm going to take a couple of deep breaths. I brought the intensity then. Um, and uh, look, after the withdrawal of Hooper, which was a big thing 24 hours out, and down, was it 19 I think it's another, it's, an, it's another um, sign of the pressure of international sport. Like, mm. it, it clearly is. Like, it, it is. And, and when you're a leader and a captain, you've got, you've got to be on. Every moment of the day, you can't can't be off because that provides an inkling for others to potentially slacken off. So, um, you know, pretty courageous for him to pull out um, and 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 just be straight up. And and I think I don't know I, I don't know Dave Rennie personally, but when he speaks, I listen. And and um, you know, a couple of things he said about him is it's a hell. Of, Dave Rennie's coached some pretty impressive people, pretty impressive leaders, and he said he's one of the best. Mm-hmm. Like. It's a hell of a tip of the cap. Yeah, yeah. I like Michael Hooper. He's a hell of a straight-up dude. Yeah. He just says it. He, he doesn't hide his emotions. Like, his face tells the story pretty much all the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but to be without him, such, you know, an all-time great of the game, to be without him, to be down at halftime in Argentina and to come back and win like that was pretty impressive, Joey. Yeah, they were immense, weren't they? And oh, I thought we greedy that him to come in at, at late notice. And, and just to your point, yeah, the courageousness of Michael Hooper to do this. Um, yeah, amazing. Realised he wasn't right and then pull out. But yeah, I, I thought um, to be thrown that curveball at, at the 11th hour and then to deal with it like the Wallabies did um, was, was really impressive. And also losing another one of their game drivers and leaders who have been around a long time, Quade Cooper, um, they just seemed to, to go to another level. And I think the growth in their game, um, especially in a, you know, it's it's a tough place to go, Argentina, and, and, and play. It's a, it's an intimidating country to go play in. They're fanatical fans. And um, a, a Wallabies team of old probably would have rolled over and, um, and got thumped in that game when they lose your leader that close to the game. But that team it seemed to galvanise them, which is, um, you know, that shows that that, that team and the and the culture that they're building there is in a really really good place. Um, they've got a lot of belief in it and starting to develop a lot of depth. But <clears throat> the pleasing side of that result, I think, from a Wallabies perspective, is man, their forwards stepped up. Their their maul was brilliant. I think Dan McKellar, um, the Brumbies head coach, has worked wonders over the last couple of seasons in terms of developing a real hard edge uh, to that to that forward pick and. We're starting to see it, and they're getting some results, especially at more time. I, I thought they were brilliant. They were really well organised. And, you know, in those um, those aspects of the game, we know how important they are at Test Match Footy. And that Wallabies team, man, that's that was what that um, effort was built on, was some some brilliant mauling play and some brilliant uh, forward play. It was, yeah, it was a good watch. And I, I thought, 
yeah, just showed where that team's at at the moment. I think Dan McKellar, the assistant coach, he can take a lot of credit for that because, yeah, they're bringing some real steel and they're going to be a, a force to be reckoned with, I reckon, in this rugby championship. I think the most impressive thing for me, you talk about improvements from June series to rugby championship is probably that second test in particular, you know, Aussie lost it rather than England winning it and, and by that I mean in that last 20 minutes their, their line out failed them, they had multiple opportunities, they went into the 22 and that was either a not straight or it's overthrow or they, you know, and they weren't clinical. Man, under even more pressure away from home, they were, they dominated that last 20 minutes. Like, yeah. and, and, and the good sides, when they're under that pressure and they lose leaders, um, they go to their pack and they keep it simple. They go, let's just go to the corner, we'll keep it under there, and the pack's just going to bring us home. And that's exactly what they did. Yeah. And that was the most impressive part of that, about that victory for me. is Because like in that first half, Quaid was on fire. I, I thought Quaid lit up their attack. He gave them confidence. I don't know what it is when he plays at 10, but they just look a better side. Um, so <clears throat> that'll be a key uh, positional yeah. adjustment. Because use that Pattaya try... Just the depth, so Paisami gives that ball out the back. The depth Quaid plays with, like, all these rush Ds can't touch him. And he goes across the field, he's ball in two hands. And in, in a position where there was no space, he created space. Mm -hmm. Purely because he adjusted his depth and said, yeah, come get me. Bang. Pattaya. Powerful. And Pattaya had a bit of work to do, but I, I don't know. This, he, he does ignite the guys around him. He brings the best out of those young players. It was a hell of a ball from Paisami to get it to him as one example. So, uh, you know, Lolaseo, whoever goes in there needs to, you know, be able to adjust their depth and manipulate defences the way Quaid does because it really frees up and ignites the players around him. Richie Moonga, on the other hand, he has got a little bit of that swag and plays quite well from depth. Is that something that could help the All Blacks with their attack? Well, I think depth, you know, adjusting your depth is always... Um, it gives you the ability to break down rush defence, doesn't it? It gives you time to make decisions and the right decision, whether it's kick, run, pass. Mm. Um, but you've got to get front foot ball. Like we did speak about the Aussie pack and, and, and they provide the platform. And on the try I'm talking about, mm. they sucked in defenders at that mall and did the business up front. And it's just, yeah. it's not just about depth. There's, you've just got to get that platform right. And that's why when I'm on here and we're all winning and everyone's happy, I always celebrate numbers <laughs> one to five because, yeah. you know, when it's going poorly, they get examined. And yeah. when it's going well, everyone else gets the kudos. But right. it's very important that uh, yeah. that that platform allows players like Quade Cooper, Richie Moonga, Bowden Barrett to thrive. Yeah, James, you've got to win it up front, Parsons. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we must celebrate them. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I'm not sure you're going to argue with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, <No>. Renwood. <laughs> um, let's talk about Fraser McRae, because you're a big fan, and Huge you were talking fan. about how they need to throw him straight in if they got the chance. They got the chance. Yeah, oh, mate, he had a massive... He made a massive statement in that Aussie A. Like, he, he really came of age. I almost think he made the statement to himself. Like he looked like a guy that believed in himself and would just went out there and, and, and played with energy and excitement. Um, big fan, just purely because he, he, he just keeps chipping away. He's you know, under that Brad Thorne regime, he's just got something about him. I don't know. It, I, I'm, I'm obvious, I just like the way he goes about his business. He gets stuck into everything. He's not the biggest body, but he's bloody committed. Um, and, and a big reason why I put him in my Form 15. I thought, I thought he had a great game. Mm, mm. Well, I have a look at your Form 15 there, mate, what, from the four teams in the Rugby Championship. Yeah, it was, it was obviously heavily uh, South African dominated. I went mm. uh, Nyagani at, at one, Marks at two, Mel Herbert at three. I put Scott Barrett. I thought Scott Barrett, man, his energy and his, his commitment, and he was into everything. I, I enjoyed his performance. Um, it's Beth at five, Khaleesi at six, McWright, is it McWright? Yep, that's yeah, right. McWright, uh, seven, Matera at eight. I thought he had a huge game. Um, it, almost back to his old, you know, he was into and, and, and just looked energetic. Nick White at nine. Um, I think he was a big factor in taking charge in that second half. They really started to play off him and he almost, you, you know, put it under the big boy's chest and knew when to pull it. Uh, I thought it was a really impressive performance from him. Pollard at ten. 
Mpimpi at 11, Hunter Paisami at 12, Arm at 13, um, Pattaya at 14, and Vilimsa at 15. You like the sound of that? Any changes you'd make to that 15? I liked I liked the sound of it, Jib. The only one that I was going to change, I put James uh, Slipper in there just because he first uh, time as uh, Wallaby skip getting the getting the job done uh, last minute. He obviously led that side brilliantly, um, showed a lot of belief. So uh, I gave him the nod. And uh, the other one I had was Peter Steff de Toit. Um, I thought he was brilliant. He was brutal. And um, I just think in terms of what he brings for that South African side, he is um, at the heart of a lot of the, the niggle, the... Um, the defensive pressure that they bring. So I, I just love the way that that guy plays. Um, plays with a real chip on his shoulder. But yeah, I thought Fraser McWright. He he was um, he was certainly the the next best in that seven jersey for me. He was he was brilliant, and it, he he just looks like a a, a, um, a hooper as well. Like, hooper, without though. his headgear, yeah. on blocks, um, not not a massive stature like you said, but just goes so hard and. Plays well above his weight. Um, yeah, an impressive performance. And again, at the last minute, being called on for, you know, the talismanic captain, um, you go, gee, this guy um, showed some fortitude um, over there, away from home. Yeah, awesome performance. He should be he should be bloody stoked with himself. So, who would you call the player of the round? Oh, it's hard to go past marks for me because I think I've got a bromance with him. <laughs> um, so yeah. I, I have to go him. But I thought Lacanya Arm, um, man, you know, set up a try, um, bundled Caleb out, checked George Bauer, all these little things. He he probably had the complete performance and he was out there for the 80. And I don't know, he, he's just the glue, um, both attack and defence. Like he had, a, he had a fantastic game. So probably arm, um, but like I'm going to say Marks because uh, yeah, I just have to get in there, get him in that two yeah. jersey more often. <laughs> he was all right, yeah. eh? Oh, Mark's got to be. It's got to be. Just too many. He just had all the big moments in that game. Like in that game, he, whenever they needed something special, he was the one to deliver it. And generally at the breakdown, uh, fantastic player, absolute beast. I think you probably love him so much, Chip, because um, you know he. Not that you weren't a beast, mate. But, he doesn't um, resemble anything like me. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate, I just think he's a freak. Like, he should be playing. Like I've said it. Like, every time he gets on the field, he just he makes big plays, mm. huge plays. Um, accurate line-out thrower, you know, fantastic scrummager, one of the best in the world at the breakdown, probably the best at the moment. Like Every time he comes on the field, even when he's off the bench, Crucial turnovers. He just gets massive turnovers. Yeah. What's it like taking him on in the scrum? He's a big unit. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't say much. He just does it. Yeah. No. I, I, I wasn't a big chatter, of course, Ross. <laughs> you are now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had far too much to say. That was that was my biggest weapon was my chat. <laughs> when he first turned up in Japan, he um he had the two his two Kubota. I oh, know he was with NTT then. And he had the, the two props, and he looked like he could have swallowed them with his, like, yeah. literally with his arms. He had his two long arms that far wrapped around him. He pretty much took on our Suntory pack uh, by himself. He just, like a man amongst boys, um, huge human, eh? just so wide. Like, he looks like you're looking at two people. Mm. His shoulders are that big. Bloody good, guys. We'll look forward to the MPC. Of course, we're looking forward this weekend to the Rugby Championship. Can the All Blacks bounce back in Johannesburg? Will the Wallabies deliver again in San Juan? There's a lot to go. Oh. Predictions. What are you thinking? Um, I think it's, it's, it's going to be too hard. I think the Springboks will win at Alice Park. Um, and I think Australia will do it again. Yep. And for you? Yeah, spiritual home of South African rugby. I just think massive, massive um, task for the All Blacks to, well, try. Obviously, their confidence is so high to South Africa after that first one. So I just think they're going to be too good. I think 12 and under, they'll, they'll, they'll do the job. And I think the Australians, yeah, they'll do, they'll do it again as well, just purely on the back of um, such a, a, a massive confidence-boosting win. So, yeah, I think it will be much the same this weekend in terms of the international footy Ross. Well, thank you very much for joining us again, Joey. Thanks for the insight. No, appreciate it, boys.
Appreciate it. Always good heated debate. <laughs> there was plenty of heat today. <laughs> good, James, thank you very much for your time again. Pleasure. We'll see you all again next week. Well, I'm sure we'll be talking about the All Blacks versus the Springboks for a couple of hours <laughs> at least, probably until they get home. So thank you very much for joining us. Matewa.